Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar entitled Practical Cannabis for Patients with Palliative Care Needs. Next slide, please. Okay, before we get into the presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the land on which I am presenting from the City of Ottawa is the traditional, unceded, and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. I want to acknowledge the historical oppression uh, of lands, cultures, and the original peoples, what we now know as Canada, and fervently believe that the work that we do collectively in palliative care can contribute to the healing and decolonizing journey that we all share together. Grateful to have this opportunity to be present in this territory. Next slide, please. So this national webinar is part of the Palliative Care Echo Project, which launched earlier this year. It is a five-year initiative that fosters the creation of communities of practice, or what I like to call virtual learning networks, among healthcare professionals um, who care for patients with life-limiting illnesses and their families. The Palliative Care Echo Project isn't designed to replace core fundamental training on the palliative care approach through courses like LEAP. And while LEAP isn't a prerequisite to participate in the Palliative Care Echo Project, we do encourage all of you who haven't done so to complete LEAP training to really have that foundational knowledge so that you can make the most out of your participation in sessions such as these. So the project supports uh, really Pallium's evolution beyond a, a transactional relationship with our learners to support this continuous learning journey from the time, you know, folks are in school to throughout their professional career. So we're really pleased to be, um, to be uh, presenting this to you today. And if you want more information about the Palliative Care Echo Project, please visit echopalliative.com. Next slide, please. I also like to acknowledge the financial support uh, that Health Canada has provided for the Palliative Care Echo Project. Uh, the content and the opinions that are gonna be shared uh, throughout today's presentation do not necessarily reflect the views of Health Canada. Next slide. Okay, so by way of introductions, my name is Jeffrey Mote. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Pallium Canada. I will be your host and moderator for today's session. And our presenter today is Dr. Craig Goldie, who is a palliative care physician and assistant professor at Queen's University. So we welcome Craig um, and Next slide in terms of our conflicts of interest. Uh, for starters, Pallium is a national nonprofit organization uh, founded back in 2000, uh, based in Ottawa and funded in part by Health Canada. We equip healthcare professionals, uh, healthcare organizations, and communities uh, with the skills and knowledge to provide palliative care earlier, more effectively, and more compassionately for all Canadians. In terms of conflict of interest, uh, I am an employee of Pallium Canada, and with respect to Dr. Goldie, uh, there are no financial conflicts of interest. He is an investigator on a cannabis oil trial that is associated with the Cannabis for Cancer Related Symptoms as part of the BC Cancer Foundation. Now, in terms of uh, some housekeeping items, for starters, uh, first off, please let us know who you are uh, in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Introduce yourselves. Uh, we'd love to know... Uh, who's on from where and what you do. Uh, your microphones have been muted, but it doesn't mean that we don't wanna hear from you. Uh, we would like to solicit your input and your questions throughout the entire webinar. And you can do that through the Q&A function, not the chat function. In the chat function, introduce yourselves, but for any questions, please put them in the Q&A function. Again, that's found at the bottom of your screen. Throughout the webinar, um, as moderator, I'm gonna be bringing your questions to Dr. Goldie for further discussion towards the end of his presentation. So he's not gonna be stopping throughout the presentation to answer the questions. We'll gather those and we'll save time at the end to make sure that we cover those off. So I do encourage you all to, to ask your questions um, and post your comments. And that's really gonna to add to the collective knowledge that'll be generated over the next 60 minutes. So thank you in advance for doing this. Uh, we will be collecting all of this data and information and input uh, for future reference. The session is being recorded and it's gonna be mailed, emailed to everyone uh, within about a week's time. It's also gonna be made available on the echopalliative.com website around the same time. Uh, we also ask uh, that in order to, res to respect privacy and confidentiality, that you refrain from sharing any specific details on cases or particular situations when, when posting your questions or your comments. We appreciate that. And uh, lastly, there is going to be a survey at the end of this presentation. So please, please, please fill that out. It does help us improve these sessions going forward. So thank you. Without further ado, I'm turning the floor over to Dr. Goldie. Okay, everyone. Thanks so much for, for joining us on a Friday. I know you have lots of things to do, so I appreciate you coming for this 60-minute uh, talk. 
Um, I do have a few cases at the end, but uh, we'll sort of take time for questions after a little bit of the didactic portion. And if we have some time, we can move on to them. Um, but I'm uh, obviously here to answer any questions you have. Um, and so this is supposed to be a practical cannabis uh, talk for patients with palliative care needs. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the endocannabinoid system. I'm not gonna go deep into the weeds on that. I'm gonna go through a pretty rapid review of the literature. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about the forms of cannabis administration, some of the basic principles for safety in prescribing or use. Uh, and as I said, some time for questions and maybe some cases at the end. Uh, so the endocannabinoid system is a very uh, primitive system that, that's uh, around in all animals, all vertebrates actually. Um, and it's sort of akin to the uh, opioid receptor that we have in our bodies as well. So there is uh, mainly two receptors that, that are there, which is CB1 and CB2. The CB1 receptor is mainly located in the central nervous system and various parts is listed here. Um, it's actually far more abundant than opioid receptors. Um, and so it's got, uh, not surprisingly, effects based on where it's located in the CNS on uh, memory, sleep, appetite, metabolism, pain perception and modulation, stress response, and intestinal motility. Um, the CB2 receptor is actually found in the periphery, uh, mostly in immune cells, uh, so spleen tonsils, mast cells, lymph nodes, um, and probably, presumably based on its location, has effects on uh, immune modulation. Uh, the endogenous cannabinoids, similar to the endogenous uh, opioids that we have in our body, uh, anandamide, AEA, or 2-AG. Um, AEA is sort of uh, similar to THC as an exogenous uh, cannabinoid, and 2-AG is the primary endogenous agonist that we have in our body. And similar to the endogenous opioid system, like the endorphins and kephalins, uh, they have a lot of effects on the aforementioned uh, aspects um, of pain, sleep, appetite, um, it's a fairly complicated system and there's still a whole uh, lot of basic science going on in terms of the interplay of the endogenous cannabinoids uh, and the various other receptors because we know that these have effects on more than just CB1 and CB2 and we're still learning a whole lot about that. In terms of the exogenous cannabinoids or things that we bring in uh, from outside our body, uh, there's really two main categories. We've got our phytocannabinoids or products that are derived from a plant, so the cannabis plant. And then nabiximols is a, a pharmaceutical uh, version of uh, the plant extract known as Sativex here in Canada. And then we have two synthetic cannabinoids, which are cannabinoids that are made uh, not from a plant. Um, and we have Marinol, which is actually not available in Canada anymore uh, as a business decision, which is a synthetic version of THC. It is THC just made uh, from a lab rather than uh, a plant. And then Nabilone, which is a synthetic THC analog or mimic. So it looks uh, to the body like THC, but it's actually a different molecule. Uh, there's of course other ones that are <laughs> we're working on and there's a huge number of interest in uh, drug companies in synthesizing various versions of uh, THC molecules or CBD molecules that are not from the plant. In terms of the cannabis plant itself, um, there's really two main uh, subtypes. So there's uh, cannabis sativa and cannabis uh, indica. Sativa came from China and indica came from India. So sativa was more warm growing areas. And traditionally, uh, in terms of natural uh, growth, sativa uh, tended to have a lot more THC and was more considered activating and high producing. And indica uh, was considered more uh, CBD and um, sedating and relaxing. Um, but at this point, uh, there's been such uh, mixing of sativa and indica strains that you can really get you know, sativa strains that are all CBD and indica strains that are high in THC. Uh, and so there's such a, a hybrid of them that that's uh, no longer a significant distinction. But when you do read um, cannabis strains, they'll often mention that they're either sativa or indica derived. Um, the plant itself, the, the leaves and the stem are not uh, that useful. It's actually uh, in the flowers of the female plant, the buds, 
uh, where the cannabinoids and terpenes are found, and specifically in the trichomes, which is sort of a little white sappy crystal uh, that is on uh, there. Um, it's thought that the plants use this actually as a defense against pest, uh, pests and uh, fungal infections, so it was sort of a natural defense mechanism similar to how caffeine was initially uh, basically an anti um, uh, microbial anti-infective uh, for plants, uh, which we've since learned to use uh, for our own purposes. The main uh, star of the show for, th uh, for cannabinoids is THC or Delta-9 THC. Uh, in terms of how it works, it's a considered a partial agonist, which means it binds at CB1 and CB2, but not particularly tightly. Uh, and because of its binding, it seems to have, well, certainly has psychoactive properties, would have presumably analgesic properties, anti-nausea, anti-emetic properties, muscle relaxant, anti-spasmodic and anti-inflammatory properties. <clears throat> THC also works at other receptors. Uh, these are trans receptor proteins, TRP receptors, which a number of other molecules bind at and seem to have uh, effects for pain, nausea, sleep, et cetera. And again, the basic science is still working on uh, the properties of these other receptors that um, THC works at. Again, speaking to this being a very primitive system, the body is uh, very interested in replicating as much as possible. So a lot of these receptors like CB1 and CB2 look like other receptors, which means that all of these exogenous things we put in bind to more than just one um, receptor. And so that interplay is obviously fairly complex uh, and still uh, needs to be fully clarified. The probably uh, darling of, of people's interest at this point would be cannabidiol or CBD. CBD has the benefit of being uh, non-psychoactive and that's fairly uh, good evidence to support that. Presumed to be a fairly good anti-inflammatory, presumed to be a fair anti-anxiety and postulated to be an antipsychotic possibly because it's non-psychoactive and actually probably attenuates the psychoactive parts of THC. Known to be a fairly good anticonvulsant, and that's actually the one area with good evidence which we'll talk about. It seems to inhibit or otherwise alter the metabolism of THC, which is probably uh, helpful. And it's interesting because we don't really understand how it does its job because it doesn't actually bind the cannabinoid receptors it seems to bind next to them in this very complicated basic science property of binding adjacent to the, the receptor and affecting uh, both uh, endogenous cannabinoids, so anandamide and 2-AG. When they bind at the CB1 receptor, it modulates that <laughs> negatively, so it decreases um, the, the sensitivity. It seems to... Um, inhibit the reuptake of uh, AEA, and it seems to probably reduce the effectiveness of THC uh, at that binding property. Uh, and it also binds to some of the other receptors, uh, TRPV1 is one specifically, and has its own effect on that. And so one of the interesting things is the, the entourage effect is such a prominent part of cannabis literature, which is um, there's so many uh, interplays between THC, CBD, and actually all the other uh, cannabinoids that it's very hard to tease out how much is THC alone versus CBD alone versus the combination of those two, as well as the combination of other properties. And so there's some thoughts that whole plant extracts may have additional benefits or certainly different properties than a synthetic THC would or a synthetic THC and CBD alone would. To, to make the plant more complicated, there's a whole host of other cannabinoids found in uh, cannabis uh, strains. So there's a list of three right there that have uncertain clinical properties. There's actually over 110 uh, cannabinoid extracts uh, in, in the plant itself, uh, generally in very small quantities, so far less than 1%. So presumably negligible contributing factor, but hard to say for sure. And then also uh, the terpenes. And the terpenes are the smell and the taste uh, of cannabis. And uh, they seem to have some properties of their own in terms of being for pain relief, for uh, anxiety, for mood. <clears throat> so myrcene is sort of a clovey hoppy. Uh, 
uh, smell and taste, <clears throat> which is considered fairly sedating and relaxing, and the so-called body buzz or body high. Uh, limonene is considered a little bit more uh, actually um, uh, alertness and euphoria uh, <clears throat> and, and antidepressant and pinene similarly is probably more uh, of a you know alertness and creative uh, uh, terpene and uh, the the enterprising people who are uh, cannabis connoisseurs have created all sorts of tables and graphs and and charts that sort of lay out uh, the terpenes and possible uh, effects of them, but the the science uh, behind that, uh, in terms of cannabis terpenes, is very uh, weak. So I'm going to go through the the evidence for uh, different properties, and of course, in palliative care, we're we're interested in the whole person, um, but obviously, a lot of the trials, not surprisingly, are looking at a specific symptom uh, that they'd be using it for. So I'll talk about cancer pain and chronic pain, and obviously, those can be separate. Um, most of the the patients that I look after have cancer, but not all of them. And uh, the, the evidence would support that it's probably or even possibly helpful in opioid sparing for cancer pain, a little bit more questionable for chronic pain, uh, and fairly clearly helpful for sleep in patients with pain. And so I put a couple of, of important um, papers there. And uh, the META study is fairly old. It's from 2008, but it was a, a nice study of patients with cancer pain that were on opioids, as well as all of our other medications for their pain. And they were put on a nabilone. It was an observational study and uh, put on sort of a low dose. It was half a milligram at night and then increased up to twice a day. Most people ended up on one milligram twice a day for 30 days and <clears throat> versus uh, uh, no treatment uh, with nabilone and just standard uh, palliative care treatments. And they did show a fairly impressive uh, reduction in pain scores in that study, which is 112 patients. Uh, they showed a reduction in opioid doses in terms of the regular and breakthroughs. Uh, they showed reductions in nausea, anxiety, and reductions in other medications that would have been used for some of those symptoms. So less NSAIDs, tricyclic antidepressants, gabapentin for neuropathic pain, steroids, metoclopramide, nondansetron for nausea. And so their conclusion was it was quite helpful for cancer pain as well as other symptoms in their uh, palliative care population. Uh, Nabiximols or Sativex had three studies actually done for intractable cancer pain as it was described. Um, and it was the Johnson study in 2010 that actually got the indication for uh, pain uh, or intractable cancer pain. Um, and so these three studies were all uh, in cancer pain patients. Um, the first was interesting because it actually didn't show uh, a overall reduction in pain scores in the people using uh, the uh, Sativex spray versus a TH, THC spray or a placebo extract. Um, but they did find uh, some responders. So one of their other ways of looking at it was uh, did people have a 30% reduction in their pain? So maybe their average pain scores um, of everybody didn't change, but were there some responders as they call them? And they did show that there were 43% of patients in the, in the Sativex group that had a response, meaning more than a 30% reduction in pain. Interestingly, it was 20% in placebo, which is not that surprising. The placebo effect is quite strong for pain. Um, and 23% for the THC spray alone that didn't have CBD in there, which was a bit uh, of a surprise, actually. Um, the two other studies, the, the 2012 and 2018 studies, um, actually were negative trials that didn't show a huge response. So um, they looked in the second one as a primary endpoint, having that reduction, 30% reduction in pain, didn't show any difference. Um, they did show that there were a few um, people that had some benefits in the lower doses versus higher doses. And then the 2018 study, they were looking again to see a pain scores or patient uh, evidence of change or opioid use. All of those things were being looked at. None of them actually showed a benefit. Um, and a few other endpoints that they used didn't show improvement, except in the US. And they did an interesting extract between American patients and the rest of the world. Okay. 
And the American patients were usually on lower doses of opioids compared to the rest of the world and probably had a bit uh, more uh, neuropathic pain than the other uh, patient population. But it was a little bit of a stretch to say that it was helpful for American patients for those purposes. Um, there's been a, uh, a couple of interesting studies uh, that are more cohort studies because, again, you know, a lot of these things are uh, not subject to good randomized control trials, um, but they're actually more observational or cohort studies. So uh, in this year, there was a UK study where they basically allowed patients to uh, get a cannabis oil extract. I think they got it from Canada, actually. Uh, and they looked uh, at their, their use in a naturalistic setting in terms of sleep quality, pain subscales, brief pain inventory, et cetera. And they did show that actually there is quite a lot of improvement uh, in sleep, you know, overall pain and discomfort scores and pain in, uh, inventories. Uh, interestingly, they're mostly on uh, CBD high and THC low oils. Um, but there was also a lot of problems with that because how the patients were using it was all over the map because it was observational. Uh, and rather than a good controlled trial. So it was very difficult to, to be clear on what the different oils and the different dosings were helpful for. But it did seem to be useful when patients were using it to their own benefits. The Nuri study, which is also, uh, or sorry, the uh, Uberall study in 2019 uh, was a German one where they were looking at patients uh, on a cannabis oils again and they did show quite an improvement uh, in pain intensity, pain-related disabilities, functionality, sleep, well-being, quality of life. And so they had this uh, number of different sort of types of suffering, and they looked at it and basically showed uh, quite an improvement in most of the domains. Um, in terms of the systematic reviews uh, for cancer and chronic pain, uh, there is one published recently in, in 2021 um, which actually showed um, that they had moderate to high certainty, uh, but the evidence that non-inhaled medical cannabis or cannabinoids uh, resulted in a small or very small improvement in pain relief, physical functioning, and sleep quality uh, in patients with chronic pain. It was predominantly non-cancer pain compared to uh, placebo. And then the other big study for uh, was Nuri, where they looked at <clears throat> whether uh, cannabis actually was opioid sparing, again, in chronic pain, not cancer pain. And basically, uh, it remained very uncertain because there's very poor evidence in terms of uh, randomized trials and observational studies. So the conclusion's fairly vague about how well it works um, in terms of the evidence, but the systematic reviews usually only include uh, fairly robust randomized control trials, of which there are quite uh, limited ones. For neuropathic pain, I think it's likely considered to be a little bit more um, likely to be helpful for patients. And a lot of the uh, pain uh, guidelines have uh, cannabis listed as maybe a second or third line option for neuropathic pain. Um, there's been a few important papers for uh, smoked cannabis, which was HIV neuropathy, uh, dronabinol, um, which is the Marinol, uh, showed that it was somewhat helpful um, for uh, the uh, MS-associated neuropathic pain um, with a number needed to treat of three and a half to get a 50% reduction in pain, which is pretty good for neuropathic pain medications. That's comparable to most of our other options. Uh, they did another Nivik small study uh, for peripheral neuropathic pain of, of different kinds, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, for instance, uh, and actually didn't show that much of an improvement, but there was a small subset, actually 20%, that had a, a fairly good response, 50% reduction, um, versus a small number in the placebo group. So again, there seemed to be some responders, but not necessarily an overall benefit for everybody that's tried on it. And then there was another uh, study uh, for uh, chronic pain uh, that was not quite as positive. Um, the uh, Bastard study, sorry, that says Uberall, that should actually say Bastard 2019. Uh, that was a study of looking at nabilone versus gabapentin for uh, chronic neuropathic pain and showed actually comparable results in terms of pain, sleep, uh, and patient uh, impression of change 
Uh, so it seemed to be comparable to gabapentin. Um, the nabilone was dosed uh, two to three milligrams per day in divided doses. The gabapentin was 1,600 to 2,400 uh, milligrams per day. So fairly high doses of gabapentin and showed comparable benefit uh, uh, by about six months. <clears throat> and then once again, due to the limited evidence, uh, limited strong evidence, uh, the Cochrane Review in 2018 said, there's no high quality evidence for the efficacy of any cannabis-based medicine, herbal cannabis, plant-derived THC, synthetic THC, uh, for any condition with chronic neuropathic pain. So a fairly uh, negative uh, impression at that point in time. Uh, but I think there's a lot of thought from the observational study data and more from uh, experiential perspectives that it probably is more helpful for neuropathic pain possibly than regular somatic pain. Moving on to nausea, this is one place where the evidence is fairly uh, clear um, for chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting, although there's very little evidence for nausea for all comers. Um, and there's a couple of reviews there uh, in 2001, 2008, and a Cochrane review in 2015, which basically all conclude that cannabis-based medications are uh, useful for refractory chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. Um, but there are fair limitations. Um, specifically that those first two um, meta-analyses in 2001 and 2008 were somewhat before our good antiemetics uh, that we use now for chemo came out. So our ondansetrons um, were not so widespread in 2001 and our prepotents or NK1 medications uh, were not uh, uh, out in 2008. So uh, it was comparing against sort of older medications that we don't traditionally use uh, as much for a uh, chemo-induced nausea vomiting anymore, because nowadays the standard for most chemos would be on Dancitron, usually steroids, possibly a prepotent and olanzapine. And quite frankly, our conventional medications are really good at chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. Um, but this is another area of some benefit. And interestingly, there is pretty clear um, support by patients that they uh, they very much prefer uh, to be on cannabis-based medications um, by, by a huge factor, even if the actual control from uh, the studies in terms of nausea control and vomiting control were not uh, that different. So there's a preference uh, for the effects, and possibly that's because of, outside of just the nausea, you know, the cannabis may be helping with sleep, it may be helping with relaxation, it may be helping with appetite, mood, or pain. So sometimes it's the fact that cannabis probably has multiple ways of helping patients that patients prefer versus strictly for the one indication like nausea. Cancer anorexia, I'd say this is where patients are really, uh, really hoping that something will help because as we well know, uh, there really is not a whole lot of good treatments for cancer anorexia or cancer cachexia. And it's really disturbing for patients and obviously the conventional uh, feeling that cannabis is great for the munchies and great for appetite is pervasive in popular culture. Uh, but unfortunately, it's pretty clear that it's not really that helpful for cancer anorexia. Um, there was a good ex uh, study of, of an, a cannabis extract. Um, and, and I suppose it was positive in some ways because it improved appetites in 73% of patients, um, but so did the placebo. Uh, and so did a THC-only extract. Um, so there was no difference in appetite, quality of life, or toxicity, although we like the placebo effect. If it works, it works. Um, and one thing that I find uh, the most useful, and this was shown in the Brisebois study in 2011, uh, which was dronabinol, which we don't have in Canada, but is just THC, uh, synthetically produced, but still THC, showed a pretty uh, nice improved chemosensory perception, uh, meaning food appeal, um, smell and taste um, for, for the patients. And uh, there was a little shift that patients uh, ate some more protein and a little bit less carbohydrates. Um, they ate a little more calories, but the, the difference was 100 calories. It went from 1600 to 1700 calories per day. So it really didn't lead to an improvement in appetite that led to any weight gain, for instance. Um, but it, there were a lot of great um, patient reports in that study on the fact that they could now sit at the dinner table with their family 
or that they could be in the kitchen while food was being prepared. And even if they didn't eat more, there was a, an appreciation of food, um, which most of our patients have lost. So that is something that I think is worth uh, considering and talking about with our patients. Um, the Jatoy study is a, quite an old one, but it was one comparing our, one of our old standard treatments, which was um, a gastrol acetate or megase, um, which has some uh, reasonable evidence for appetite improvement, although not you know, lean weight or function, uh, which is of course what we're hoping for, um, but basically showing that uh, megase or megastral acetate, megase improved appetite, um, but the addition, uh, it was better than, than trinabinol and the combination was not uh, helpful. So it didn't appear to be helpful to have two different kinds of medications for appetite. So unfortunately this remains an area that we don't have wonderful long-term treatments for necessarily. Sleep. Sleep is a fascinating one because there's absolutely no evidence uh, for sleep uh, in, in trials that are for sleep specifically for, uh, for THC or CBD that we can uh, report on. Um, sleep is talked about in the pain studies and in the nausea studies, and often uh, sleep is a score that is looked at, but it's not actually uh, routinely being studied as a direct response to insomnia. Um, there was a paper in 2017 that talked about the, some of the basic preliminary research that suggests that CBD may have potential for the treatment of insomnia. THC, sorry, CBD has therapeutic potential for uh, insomnia. THC can help decrease sleep latency so people fall asleep faster, but it may uh, worsen sleep quality long-term, so that's a bit of a concern. Um, CBD seems to be potentially more helpful uh, for insomnia and excessive daytime sleepiness. And there's some thoughts that THC or THC-based uh, cannabinoid medications like Navalone could help with things like nightmares associated with PTSD. Uh, and as well, patients who have really impaired sleep quality due to chronic pain may be improved again by THC. But that remains an area of uh, very little understanding. Spasticity. Um, it seems in patients with multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injury that it's probably helpful. And that is one of the indications. Um, it's probably again, mostly in patient perception. So most of the, the studies uh, didn't show that in objective scores where you're using objective measures of spasticity that there was a difference, um, but patients improved, felt that their spasticity was improved in pain as well as mobility. So there's sort of a theme where a lot of these studies show um, you know, hard, hard endpoints uh, or very fixed endpoints don't seem to be as uh, improved, whereas more global uh, impressions or quality of life scores or pain and sleep scores in com combination seem to be helpful or pain and specificity scores. Uh, a couple of bigger reviews showed that there wasn't a huge response. Again, nabiximols or Sativex was studied in three trials. Uh, there was really, they, they considered it uh, in, in terms of reducing spasticity, but it wasn't that impressive. Um, on a 10 point scale in the, in the Sativex group, it went down 1.3 and in the placebo group, it went down 0 0.97. I would argue that's not clinically relevant. Um, but once again, there were some more responders uh, in the Sativex group, which presume that it's worth a trial and the people that do well will continue to do well. And then there was another uh, review of reviews um, in 2018, basically showing that there was sufficient evidence that cannabinoids may be effective for pain or specificity in MS. So this is certainly an area that I think um, it's, uh, the body of evidence suggests it's pretty useful. This is a controversial one. Um, so of course, you know, there's a lot of hope um, and, and a lot of uh, um, belief uh, that, that cannabis itself is uh, anti-neoplastic or anti-cancer or will treat or cure cancers. And unfortunately, there, there is no good evidence uh, in human trials um, that uh, cannabis THC, CBD combinations, extracts, et cetera, um, are actually effective at treating cancers in terms of increasing survival or curing uh, widespread uh, cancer. Um, 
And there's reasons for people to think that and pe for people to want that, obviously, uh, in terms of thinking that there is some very, you know, uh, impressive preclinical data that shows cancer cell lines uh, in vitro respond quite well. So, so uh, cannabis uh, seems to have uh, anti-tumor effects in uh, vitro, uh, as well as antibacterial properties and antifungal properties. So again, with its sort of immune effects, it seems to be very uh, helpful. And cancer cell lines do uh, express CV1 and CV2 receptors. So our cancer cells do have these receptors on there. So it's possible, of course, that they could be modulated. And there's some interesting mouse models that show uh, response to, to um, intravenous uh, THC and CBD. And again, I think an extrapolation that people are making is that cannabis can have immune modulating properties. And I think especially since immunotherapy in the last 10 years uh, has really uh, improved cancer cells, uh, cancer survival, especially things like melanoma or lung cancer, uh, it's not surprising that people would say, well, immunotherapy works really well. Why wouldn't immune modulating uh, cannabis do that? And I think, unfortunately, uh, the evidence is, is still uh, very scant. There is one uh, recent publication uh, in 2021 on SADEVX for glioblastoma, which is a brain tumor. Uh, and it was a very small trial. It was 12 patients only. Uh, and it was for patients to be on either SADEVX with the chemo, which is temozolomide, uh, versus placebo and temozolomide. And it did show a pretty impressive result for a terrible cancer that at, at eight, one year, 83% of the patients in the SADEVX group were still alive versus only 44% in the placebo treated group. Um, one of the complicating factors when you have only 12 patients is that there were two patients in the placebo group that died uh, very quickly. So that probably skewed the results when you have these tiny numbers it would have likely just been chance that those patients had ended up in that arm versus the SADEVX group. And if it had been flipped, unclear that the benefit would still be there, but uh, it did show fair safety and tolerability. And again, a signal that bigger trials are warranted in at least in this particular tumor. Um, one of the things that I, I struggle with is a lot of patients that have been doing, doing their, their research, and I'll put research in quotes, um, that they're interested in using really high potency uh, cannabis extracts to try to cure their cancer. And some people might have heard of Rick Simpson oil uh, or Phoenix Tears. Rick Simpson's a Canadian uh, engineer who used it to treat possibly a basal cell on his skin and has since somehow extrapolated that, that cannabis can cure diabetes, uh, I think Alzheimer's, cancers of all kinds, heart disease. Uh, if you read his website, it's a an absolute litany of all the things that could be cured just with some cannabis. Um, and Phoenix Tears is, is a, a very, very high potency uh, a THC extract that patients would use. And their goals are often to take uh, 60 grams of ultra high potency THC oil over a 90 day period. And some people believe that will cure a number of cancers. Um, and it's extremely high dose and they're extremely uh, high uh, for that entire time, which is obviously a little bit of an issue. In terms of CBD alone, as I said, this is uh, very popular, especially in the US where um, it can be derived from hemp. And so um, when I went to a farmer's market with my uh, in-laws in Florida a, a couple of years ago, uh, everything was infused with CBD, the CBD coffee, CBD uh, food, CBD deodorants. It was just absolutely everywhere. And unfortunately, there's really no evidence uh, that CBD helps cancer pain, helps nausea, sleep, mood, spasticity, or anorexia, or any of the things that we uh, are looking for in palliative care. Uh, there is a trial that's coming uh, hopefully soon. Um, they published their protocol in 2019. We're now two years later, but of course, pre-COVID. Um, and I emailed the author, and there's still no data yet, but that will be lovely because it's an actual CBD-only trial for palliative symptoms. So that would be really helpful when that comes out. Um, people are very interested in CBD for arthritis pain and rheumatologic conditions due to them thinking it's a good anti-inflammatory. So there's another trial for rheumatoid arthritis that's not come out. Uh, there was a 
uh, very small trial for osteoarthritis of the hand, the very specific um, that show there is uh, no difference at all uh, in pain, sleep quality, mood, or anxiety uh, on people taking 30 milligrams of uh, CBD versus placebo over 12 weeks. Um, the area that CBD has fairly good evidence for is pediatric ep epilepsy, specifically due to a couple of pediatric conditions, Dravet syndrome or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So there is actually a, a product for uh, pediatric uh, seizure disorders, that is a CBD product that can be uh, ordered and supplied through pharmacies. <clears throat> so I think the idea of using uh, actual plant cannabis is sort of uh, less common now because there's this other product, it's an extract, but there's certainly evidence for that. There is um, some support for uh, CBD for psych psychiatric illness, specifically schizophrenia, because obviously it seems to be antipsychoactive from a THC perspective. Um, there are some interesting studies that are suggestive that schizophrenia may have uh, an underlying role, not just in the dopamine system, which is where we think most of it uh, is uh, caused by, but actually in, in, due to endogenous cannabinoids and, and problems with uh, anandamide, for instance. And so there's some thoughts that CBD might be helpful for treating schizophrenia treating anxiety disorders, social phobias, and also for addictions, not just for cannabis use disorder, um, but for other ones. But the, the evidence is quite weak in those areas. And there's been some teeny tiny studies uh, for patients with Parkinson's disease um, for various purposes. There's some ones for Crohn's disease that didn't show any improvement, a chronic pain study in kidney transplant patients for uh, a very specific population that didn't show benefit. And there was actually a topical uh, CBD oil uh, study for peripheral neuropathy that uh, didn't really show a whole lot of benefit, and it was only 29 patients. Um, the most important recent paper uh, that came out in 2020 was uh, out of New Zealand, actually, and it was 397 patients that got prescriptions for CBD uh, oil. Again, it was supplied by Bedrican here in Canada. Uh, but it was the first 400 patients who were prescribed it. And they were prescribed it for a variety of reasons, not just palliative care, not just chronic pain. Uh, the indications ranged from appetite, sleep, chronic pain, mood. Um, and I think it was a uh, study. So they got well, 397 patients with prescriptions. Uh, they lost a huge number of patients to follow up. Only 110 of those uh, patients actually completed uh, any sort of uh, proper assessments uh, pre and post. Um, of those ones, 70% felt that CBD was good, very good or excellent in an overall global rating. Um, and 30% reported no benefit. Presumably the people that didn't complete assessment, a number of them uh, stopped using it, sometimes because of cost, sometimes presumably because it wasn't helpful. Um, and the dosing was anywhere from 40 milligrams a day to 300 milligrams a day. So just absolutely wide variety being used. Um, but Again, these sort of naturalistic studies are probably helpful in the absence of really good trials. In terms of overall evidence where they kind of combine uh, cannabis for all uh, symptoms, um, there's a systematic review in 2015 in JAMA, which said moderate evidence for chronic pain and spasticity, low quality evidence for improvement in nausea, vomiting due to chemo, uh, and basically associated with some increased risk of short-term uh, adverse effects. Um, Mike Allen, who's a Canadian, uh, did a systematic review of systematic reviews that was published here in 2018, uh, looking at pain, nausea, vomiting, spasticity, and harms, which basically says reasonable evidence that it improves nausea, vomiting after chemo might improve spasticity and MS, uncertainty whether it improves pain, but if it does, it's probably neuropathic pain and the benefit's likely small. And they did say adverse effects are fairly common, and so all trials need to be um, monitored closely. And then he did come up with a simplified guideline for primary care prescribing of cannabinoids. And that's on this slide here. Um, you can retrieve it. It's in CFP. Um, it's uh, in the end of the slide deck. You can see a link to it. But essentially, outside of neuropathic pain, what they call palliative pain, which I presume they mean cancer pain because it's quite vague, uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea, vomiting, and spasticity, they recommend against using cannabinoids of any kind. 
if you've tried a number of things, they say it's reasonable to try cannabinoid. And their thought is that using the uh, nabiximols or Sativex or Nabilone is probably the best given the lack of good, uh, good evidence for cannabis plant uh, extracts themselves. In terms of harms, um, I think it's often undersold that, the, the, that these um, substances have harms. And uh, probably because it's a plant and it's natural and people think that that's you know, generally better and safer. Um, and to be fair, adverse effects are usually mild as reported in trials and obviously widespread uh, use recreationally at this point. Generally, the harms are not that significant. Uh, but in most of the trials where they looked at it, about 10% of patients uh, withdrew from the studies due to adverse events, not ineffectiveness, but just that they are having too many side effects which is about threefold higher than placebo rate. Uh, the most common symptoms, dizziness, dry mouth, sedation, and feeling high. And those can be very problematic. Um, but the most problematic ones from my perspective, and these numbers in brackets here are the odds ratio. So uh, for dizziness, you're five times more likely to be dizzy on a cannabis-based um, a cannabinoid than a placebo. Uh, confusion, somnolence, drowsiness, disorientation, balance, and paranoia. And I certainly are, uh, have seen harms of patients taking uh, Nabilone, uh, Sativex, cannabis extracts, particularly if they don't know what they're taking. And I think that's one of the biggest issues is a lot of patients that are buying <clears throat> these products not from pharmacy and not being prescribed is that they actually don't know exactly what they're taking or the amount. Um, and the, some of the studies suggested that the number needed to harm uh, with an adverse effect to six, you know, so if you give this to six people, one will be harmed, um, but that doesn't mean severely. Uh, and then, you know, about one in 14 people will stop uh, taking cannabis meds uh, due to an adverse effect. Um, and so it's certainly something that needs to be considered. There's other harms too. There's financial harms because trial and error uh, sounds great, but it can be quite expensive for patients because these are not covered medications in general. So they're either buying it through a licensed producer or recreationally uh, or uh, through Nabilone or Sativex prescription, but there is certainly a cost associated with that. I've had patients who have probably avoided our re regular conventional medications that we have really good uh, evidence and experience with. Um, and so they've been very determined to control the pain with cannabis to the exclusion of our other medications, which is a problem. Uh, an inability to drive. Uh, cannabis is uh, not something that you're allowed to drive on, and there's a lot of uncertainty about the timing of cannabis ingestion and when to drive, but anybody using it at all regularly would essentially be unable to drive most of the time if they're using it for symptoms. Uh, and uh, the, the most concerning one is always if somebody is trying to treat their cancer with uh, cannabis and avoiding or delaying uh, standard chemotherapy or systemic treatments or radiation, for instance, or surgery uh, with that. And I've seen, certainly seen harms from that too. Greg, just a time check. We have uh, 12 minutes left. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so one of the things I think is, is fairly fascinating is that there's, uh, you know, a lot of people interested in doing uh, crowdsourced uh, studies. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, cannabis enthusiasts that have looked at um, basically trying to map what strains of cannabis is the most helpful for them. And they actually have turned it into a bit of a study looking at, uh, I think, 2,500 patients using uh, and 26,000 observations of them using cannabis for uh, these symptoms that are on listed here. Uh, generally, these are not palliative patients. These are fairly young patients, tech savvy patients, um, but and they're not uh, confirmed diagnoses. Uh, this is that they are self-reporting the use for neuropathic pain or these other issues. Um, they did show uh, that this is a study that was looking at whether THC alone versus CBD alone versus a combination would be helpful. On the left axis is people who were on CBD only. Uh, the right axis is all THC. And then in the middle, 50% would mean that it's half THC, half CBD. And essentially it showed that most of them basically whatever the ratio you're at, it seems to be a similar benefit, but you'll notice that the slope is, is always to the right, meaning more THC is probably part of the improvement uh, in most of these symptoms, in particular neuropathic pain, which is that bottom graph there. Uh, CBD alone seemed to be very ineffective um, for these uh, consumers uh, versus all THC. 
All right, so moving on to forms of cannabis administration, uh, I want it to be clear that there's uh, lots of different ways of doing it, and there's not clearly a best way, but there's a, a way that I think is preferable. So uh, cannabis can be inhaled, either smoked, vaporized, um, and that can be from a dried plant, vaporized liquid, or concentrates. Uh, they can be ingested, either in oil or alcohol-based tinctures. At this point, it can be uh, eaten in edibles or, or beverages. Sublingual administration of oil or alcohol-based sprays is uh, reasonable. There's topical and actually interesting, there's transdermal. So some of the licensed producers actually have a transdermal patch, like a nicotine patch or a nitro patch or a fentanyl patch, uh, where uh, the transdermal uh, layer allows penetration of THC and CBD through the bloodstream without a first pass effect. Obviously, inhaled is the fastest, last in starts onset about five minutes, peaks around 10 minutes, lasts for about four to six hours. Ingestion is uh, slower, peaks at about 60 minutes, which is obviously a concern if people are taking a dose and not feeling anything. And then within that hour, uh, taking more and actually having to peak quite a bit later. Sublingual is fairly quick. Um, so about 30 minutes or so. Uh, topical uh, has rapid effect on the skin and transdermal, fairly quick. Uh, administration and continuously uh, releases a low dose for about 72 hours. Again, similar to a fentanyl patch. One of the issues uh, with uh, ingestion, oral ingestion, is that um, with the first pass going through the liver, um, our liver makes uh, a, a form of uh, a THC metabolite called 11-OH THC, which is quite psychoactive and crosses into the brain. And so when people take cannabis orally, they actually get quite a high level of that metabolite, which means probably a bit more psychoactive compared to some of the other forms um, where you kind of skip that first pass. So my preferred administration is sublingual oil. The reasons are it's rapid and predictably absorbed. Uh, it's not irritating the airways. There's less of that metabolite, so less likely to have psychoactive effects. And it's a shorter duration of action, which is better for titration and for PRN usage. Um, the downsides of sublingual is it can be a bit hard for patients to hold it, especially if it's higher volume, and it can irritate the mucosa, although the uh, oil-based, like uh, coconut oil-based ones, are really quite benign from that perspective. And they can be a little finicky to measure because you have to drop the oil in a syringe and use a dropper, and so it's a little bit more finicky than taking, um, you know, an edible or taking a gel cap. Dosing is very... Uh, individualized and relies on self-titration. The basic principle, of course, is start low and go slow. The general recommendation is to have uh, at least a one-to-one -one ratio of THC and CBD. Um, and we generally are at the point now where we want to be very clear, and luckily the packaging supports this, in, that we are talking about THC in milligrams, not in milliliters of oil, not in percentages of THC in the dried plant, but in milligrams of THC, because that's something that patients can replicate. And a reason, reasonable starting dose is two and a half milligrams of THC and, and thus two and a half milligrams of CBD per ingestion. Depending on the concentration of the oil, uh, that's usually about 0.1 to 0.5 milliliters uh, per ingestion. So that is a very reasonable and safe starting point. In terms of maximum, um, the majority of studies were in equivalence of THC or THC itself, less than about 30 milligrams per day. So fairly low doses. Um, and Nabilone, the monograph says going up to six milligrams a day, which would be 60 milligrams of THC because it's about 10 times stronger. Um, but in general, most of the people were using Nabilone less than about three milligrams a day. So one or one and a half milligrams twice a day. The mix of all is the majority were taking less than 12 sprays a day, mostly about five or six sprays a day. And each spray is 2.7 milligrams of THC and 2.5 milligrams of CBD. Marinol, again, is just THC, 20 milligrams a day was in the majority of the studies. Uh, and CBD maximum, we have absolutely no idea. Generally, if you're doing one-to-one, -one, you'd be thinking about similar numbers. Um, in the seizure disorders in kids, the dosings were, were massive, uh, like in terms of milligrams per kilogram per dose, so up to like 500 milligrams per dose in pediatric patients. Uh, and they did a phase one safety trial showing, I don't know who, who enrolled in this, but up to 6,000 milligrams of CBD appeared to be fairly safe. So CBD seems to have quite a high uh, safety margin. 
In terms of how you access this, uh, there is uh, the licensed producers, there's prescription cannabinoids, there's recreational cannabis and uh, home grown, and then there's gray market cannabis. Uh, the licensed producers are quite simple. You fill out a form, they fill out a registration, and they purchase it online and it's shipped to their door. Prescriptions get from the pharmacy. Recreational cannabis, uh, depending on your province, you can go into stores, you can order it online. Uh, and uh, there's really no difference between the cannabis products you can get through the licensed producers and through recreational markets. Um, in terms of the potency or THC concentration or any of those things, or the purity or pesticide or contamination. Home growing, a lot of problems with <laughs> knowing what you're growing and purity and sanitization. So it's not recommended in palliative care, nor is it recommended to get it from your friend that's growing it themselves. Uh, and gray market cannabis bought from uh, non-recreational uh, cannabis dispensaries that's not um, tested. I have a big problem with, we have a lot of access to that in Kingston. And uh, patients have uh, really a lot of uncertainty about what they're getting. They don't understand the labeling. They don't understand it. And a lot of the, the uh, products that they get is probably not what they say on the label. So uh, that is not recommended for our patients. Who, who wants a, a licensed producer? Um, there are some people who get it covered by their private drug insurance uh, or get it reimbursed through a health spending account. It can be considered a medical expense for tax returns. Um, now that there are these transdermal patches, some people do want that because the recreational market, I don't see uh, a reason that they would have uh, transdermal patches. And so some of the licensed producers do have forms that are a little bit more amenable to medical use and titration, including little gel caps. Cost-wise, uh, these medications uh, can be fairly expensive. Um, it, it's hard to say, uh, but recreational oil is probably a little bit cheaper um, than licensed producers, but it's really not that different. And it all works out to probably be a few dollars a day, at least uh, with the exception of Sativex, which is very expensive. Um, if you're using six sprays a day of that, it would be $15 a day or $450 a month, very pricey. So the basic principles of safety, um, it's really, from my perspective, reasonable to trial cannabis uh, if, the conventional medications are not well tolerated or effective, especially if they have a symptom constellation like pain with sleep interruption, poor response to our standard medications. Um, but we're doing this still with a fair, fairly limited amount of evidence. And we don't have a lot of negative studies, uh, but we do have some. And unfortunately, negative studies of Sativex are not clear what that would be in terms of the oil. So we're hoping to get more uh, trials that give us good hard data to support uh, our use or say it's not that useful. Um, I generally suggest very low uh, doses uh, of oil, particularly sublingual, uh, two and a half milligrams per dose. You can order it every four hours for symptoms like Q4H, urine for pain. Same for appetite, although usually taken before meal times, at bedtime for sleep, or if every four hours is needed for nausea, assuming that they can get it down. <laughs> Uh, they can't drive while using cannabis. It's considered six hours for sure for inhaled or sublingual forms, uh, 12 hours for oral. So essentially it means they shouldn't be driving. Um, I tell patients to be very careful because dizziness and hypotension are a concern. I don't want my patients to fall. And if they're having any uh, significant psychoactive effects, I get them to either reduce the dose or discontinue. I watch them closely. I follow up within about seven days in terms of the half-life of THC and CBD. That's well within the time where you should know what it's doing. My personal maximum is about 30 milligrams of THC per day total. Um, that's not based on anything other than I think most of the literature would say lower doses are fine. And when you get higher than that, you're probably getting higher from that and not in a good way. And I do think it's important to reassess the benefits and side effects regularly and objectively. So using ESAS, pain scores, a symptom diary, other medication use uh, to say whether it's really helping because uh, you know, I think we want to be objective of saying this is actually helping you or not. And we do have to consider some drug interactions. There are very few, but there are a few. I apologize because I walked myself all the way up to almost one o'clock, but I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, that are going to show up in the chat. Um, and I can stay on a few minutes, Jeff, if that's all right.
All right, good. Well, there's there's one that came up here. Um, it's regarding uh, someone that purchased a, a medication guidebook. It was a Canadian version of this guidebook for registered nurses, and they couldn't find any cannabis medication listed, not even Navalone. So, you have any any idea why that is? Sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. So, um, the question was: they'd recently purchased a medication guidebook. It was a Canadian version of this book for registered nurses. Um, couldn't find any cannabis medication listed, not even Navalone. Uh, any idea why that might be? I mean, no. I mean, I think I think that the challenge. I'm not sure if, if they're going to be particularly evidence based. You know, the, the the evidence is not that strong. But I really think this should be in there. I mean, you know, Navalone has it in. It has you know licensed indications. Uh, you know, it is a, a reasonable medication. And uh, I think it's something that people should be aware of and aware of the you know, risks and benefits. Um, you know, one of the popular files is uh, RX files. That's a Canadian um, uh, prescription uh, 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 guidebook out of Saskatchewan. And it's actually freely available. If you just literally Google uh, cannabinoids RX files, you can see they've got three pages on it. And it's quite a good guide because it talks about, you know, number needed to treat the costs or the adverse effects. And, and I do think um, the head and sand, uh, not talking about cannabis other than saying, well, if you're taking it, do it is, is not the best way to go about it. I think this is, uh, you know, honest conversations with your patients about why they're using it, what benefit they're getting and reassessing that regularly is part of palliative care. As we know, palliative care is all about impeccable assessment. Part of that impeccable assessment is talking about, you know, cannabis that they're using or wanting to use and discussing its reasonableness. Very good. A couple of the questions come through here. Um, one from Valerie who says that, uh, that you stated that the quality of the cannabis from recreational stores is equal to what comes from, from an LP. However, um, she's been told in, in other education, um, cannabis competent nurse course, for instance, uh, that the LPs are held to a higher standard as far as quality and consistency than the rec stores. Um, so it's, it has always been something she said uh, that I mentioned a patient, that she mentioned to patients uh, given the proximate, given the proximity to so many cannabis stores in, in her area. So any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the, the, the roles are, are pretty clear. I, I'm, I, maybe the testing is more frequent uh, at the licensed producers, but as far as I'm aware, I mean, they, they are held to the standard that recreational cannabis is supposed to document the number of milligrams uh, in the product uh, of THC and CBD, and that, that it is tested not only for, you know, the, the, truth of that packaging that the THC is in there, as well as for, again, pesticides, residues, um, and, uh, and fungal infections. So I think the quality from my perspective from, from recreational stores is, is comparable. Uh, there may be some minute differences in, in terms of the, the testing. The, the gray market cannabis, I have very little faith in the, the uh, quality of, of, of the cannabis or that the label ref reflects what they're actually getting. Uh, in terms of replicatability. Um, but the recreational stores, I think, are a fair option. And one of the problems, I, I think, with the licensed producers from a trial perspective is they, they, they traditionally didn't have a lot of options. You basically were, were committing to buy a $100 bottle of oil and seeing if that bottle of oil worked for you. And if it didn't, well, too bad. Try, try a different one. I will say Spectrum, which is one of the, the you know, closest licensed producers in Kingston, they now have a, a trial pack of, of uh, gel caps of, of variety so they've got colors so they've got blue yellow uh, and red cannabis so some is thc only cbd only in a mix and you can actually buy a fairly small quantity to see how it's helpful which i think is a response to this problem because i, I think there's a lot of n of one trials and if if you have to spend as i mentioned financial harm a lot of money to try these different ones the recreational market's very applicable because you can buy you know uh, you know, some, some oil for, for $10 or $15 and try it. And I would argue probably if you find something that works really well, it might be worth then going to the licensed producers. Although arguably if you're, if you're getting something good recreationally, uh, it can help. I think I didn't mention this. One of the biggest challenges is if you have a really good uh, response to a particular product uh, in the recreational stores, there's no guarantee that they'll always have that. And that that's always an issue. These is a, you know, it's, it's a, a product that may come in and out of availability. 
I think the licensed producers do do a bit better job of um, having uh, reliable strains in, in, in uh, place. So if you find a strain that works really well for you, you're likely to be able to continue to get it from the licensed producers versus your local cannabis shop saying, we just don't have those gummies today or we don't have that oil today. Um, so that is probably for, for you know, a long-term use once you find something that works is a benefit of licensed producers. No, that's very clear. Thanks, Valor, for that question. Kendall asks, uh, any caution in using Nabilone and CBD THC oils at the same time in a client with advanced cancer pain, including neuropathy and difficulty sleeping? Um, I mean, I think the THC being, you know, a synthetic uh, analog of THC, I mean, in theory, they're competitively binding at the CB1 receptor. Um, I think it would just be murky in terms of the, the additive benefits because they are two separate substances. Um, you know, the CBD that's in the, the cannabis would be protective. And we do think CBD is protective of uh, Nabilone's effects, not just THC's effects. So in theory, CBD might offset any psychoactive properties. Um, so I, I don't think there's a, be a major issue with that, but I think it's just probably a little bit of caution in terms of uh, dosing. And Nabilone, um, you know, again, being 10 times stronger, uh, you know, one milligram of Nabilone doesn't seem like a lot, but that's 10 milligrams of THC, uh, which is a, a fair, a fair dose. So I find Nabilone a little hard to titrate because you're, you're titrating in pretty big chunks from my perspective. Yeah, understood. Um, very specific question here is sublingual cannabis in spray form only. Uh, you can get it. Um, I mean, that's usually alcohol based. The only issue with that is it can be quite irritating to the mucosa in repeated usage. Um, but it is, it's available. Actually, the recreational stores offer it too, and that, and that is what Sativex is. Um, and it's certainly probably more convenient because this, you know, the bottle itself uh, is a standard dose every time you push it, versus having to draw up the oil um, out of a out of a, a cannabis oil bottle into a syringe and then drop it, you know, either on your tongue or on a spoon and put it in your mouth. So the sprays offer some convenience. Um, Oil is generally the, the most common and prevalent base, usually coconut oil or, or safflower oil. So I don't have a strong preference. Very good. Uh, thanks for that, Patrick. Robin asks, uh, there's been a few uh, case reports in the literature about interactions with methadone. Have you seen this in your cl clinical practice? No, so I haven't. So, so I mean, THC does have some interactions um, I'd have to double check because I don't memorize it. Uh, it's not 3A4 and 2D6, which are the, the methadone uh, metabolite interaction. So I don't believe that's considered to be a significant one. And we don't actually think a THC interacts with our other opioids in particular. So from, from an other opioid perspective safety factor, that's not a concern. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certainly some interactions with high dose THC uh, it's mostly with antidepressants uh, uh, and a few uh, anticonvulsants, I believe, but I, I'm not aware of an interaction with methadone. Um, I don't have any patients that are actually taking both at the same time, but I would certainly, before prescribing Nabilone or THC, look it up. Um, interesting question. Uh, Patrick asks if they actually give counseling to cancer patients in cannabis shops. To your knowledge, <laughs> so I think I'm not sure what the the um, the law is, but I don't think that the recreational stores are supposed to talk about medicinal benefits. I think they allude to it, and, and yes, I do think that they are well-meaning and try to help it. And they can probably say, you know, I've had patients with cancer use this and found it helpful, um, but I don't think that they're to be honest, at all equipped to, for you to go in and say, I've got, you know, chemo induced peripheral neuropathy, like what is the best, you know, cannabis oil you have with THC and terpenes and all of those things. I, I think frankly, nobody knows. Uh, and so I, I would be cautious with their enthusiastic um, su suggestions, um, but, but no, so I don't think that they do. I do think that the licensed producers uh, try to provide a bit more support from that. Um, so that, that's the issue with the recreational stores. And they often, you know, might come out with a, you know, a, a, a THC cookie 
edible as, as the product, uh, which is a problem to dose. So um, I, I usually ask that they go in and look for something that's balanced THC, CBD. Uh, and then typically I ask them to, to bring it into me or, or like call me and let me know what it is. And then we can talk about what the, the dosing would be. Yeah. Well, one of the uh, participants here in the chat function said in Quebec, it's actually against the law to offer substance counseling and education. Yeah. I, I presume it's it's discouraged. I don't know how you know how it's written into the the, the cannabis act, mm -hmm. um, which is of course a federal law, but provincially enacted. So it's the interplay between uh, right. the, the federal and provincial uh, regulators. But I I don't think that they should. Uh, I don't know if they do or if they sort of surreptitiously say I've seen patients think yeah. this was really helpful, and sure. that's a bit different than counseling them. Very good. Well, that wraps up uh, the questions uh, in the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of our screens. I think there's one other slide left, uh, Craig. Uh, I've got some well, yes references to, to, there. To jump through. I know there's a couple of cases we can get covered off, but... Uh, yeah, that's all, that's all right. I think I appreciate all the questions that people had. Um, yeah. And these are some of the references there. And obviously, you guys can see the slide deck in the presentation. So um, feel free to take a peek afterwards. Absolutely. And I just want to take a moment to thank everyone for their, uh, for their participation in today's webinar. Thank you for your questions. And a huge thank you to Dr. Craig Goldie for, uh, for sharing what is an incredible amount of information. I thought it was very clearly presented. Uh, I know we all walked away with a lot more information and feel a lot more informed on this evolving subject of cannabis. So thank you very much, Dr. Goldie, for sharing your knowledge knowledge and information with everyone. And I would encourage everyone again, fill out those uh, post-webinar surveys. We do want to hear from you. Uh, we do cherish this feedback, as Dr. Goldie said, and as I said earlier in the presentation, uh, this presentation will be emailed to you and it'll also be posted on the echopalliative.com website. Um, so thank you again uh, to everyone for being part of the session today and to wish you all a very good weekend. And we look forward to, uh, to seeing you again on an upcoming webinar. Thank you, all, all the best.